All right, we're in Colossians 4, starting with verse 2, and we're going to look at verses 2 through 6 today. This is what Paul writes, Colossians 4, 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So Paul is nearing the end of his letter to the church at Colossae, and he says, there are two things that I'm passionate about. I think Paul is saying, here are the two things that like burn in my heart. One is prayer. And two is getting the message to outsiders. Look at the first little phrase in Colossians 4.2, devote yourselves to prayer. And I want to just explain exactly what this phrase means because after reading four or five commentaries, of, after digging deep into this text, uh, I know what this little phrase means. It means this, devote yourselves to prayer. <laughs> when Paul uses this word devote, he means persist at it. It means to remain at something or to cling to something or to uh, continually be available for something. Uh, it was used for a boat that was uh, continually available for service. Resolve that you will keep praying and not give up. I recently made the decision to start working out. Uh, I'm going to be 40 soon, and so for some reason I have this desire to get in the best shape of my life at 40 years old. Um, so I started working out a couple months ago, and I'm sure most of us have done something like this in our lives. We have a vision for something, and then you start. And uh, I think we can all understand that starting is easy, right? Starting is fun. Starting a marathon is the easy part, right? What is hard? Persevering, right? Persevering, getting through the 11th mile persevering and getting through the 21st mile and crossing the finish line. Persevering is hard. Persevering is hard. Persevering is what matters most. And there's no area of life where the Bible encourages perseverance more strongly than the area of prayer. Writers of scriptures knew that as fallen people, we are apt to get discouraged or bored or distracted or feel guilty and just give up, just stop praying. And so constantly they said, whatever else you do or don't do, don't stop praying. In Luke 18.1, Jesus tells the story of the persistent widow. This is what he says. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. In Luke 11, Jesus tells the story of a persistent neighbor. Uh, a person goes to his neighbor and everything's against him. It's midnight. The door's locked. The, he, he's in bed. His children are asleep. And Jesus says, but if you persist with this neighbor, he'll get up and give you whatever you need. And if that's the case with a neighbor like that, how much more should we persist with God, who is never asleep and is always attentive to us? In the same passage, Jesus tells a story about a parent giving good gifts to his children. And Jesus says, if that's true with parents who are fallen people, how much more will God give good gifts to us? his children, when we ask. Paul gives us an example of this in Colossians 1.9. Paul says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We haven't stopped. We haven't given up, Paul says. The message is consistent throughout Scripture. We are to persevere in prayer. And I just want to get real practical for a moment, especially for those of us in this room who struggle with prayer. If you find that your prayer life is going well, uh, by all means, use whatever works for you. I mean, if your prayer life is on a good track, just stay on that track. Do whatever you're doing. A friend of mine once told me, if you're praying, you're doing it right. If you're praying, you're doing it right. If you're praying, just keep doing what you're doing. Dallas Willard reminds us that the more we pray, the more we think to pray. In other words, the frequency of prayer begins to build a kind of momentum that eventually puts you in the condition that Paul describes in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 when he says, pray without ceasing. 
When I was a younger Christian and someone would say, you might get to the point one day when you pray without ceasing, I thought, there's no way. I mean, that didn't even occur to me when I was a young Christian. I didn't even think it was possible. But some of you know, if you've prayed throughout the course of your Christian life, and if you've devoted yourself to prayer, and if you've stretched yourself throughout the years of your life in prayer, you really do come to the place where you kind of carry on this ongoing dialogue with God throughout the course of your day. It feels kind of like breathing. It just feels natural. You feel like something would be wrong if you weren't carrying on that kind of dialogue with God. Now, let's just be clear about something here. Jesus taught in Matthew 6, 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Heavenly Father. There are times when you should go into your room, shut the door, and pray. You should have a more formalized, unrushed, focused time of prayer. So there are two kinds of prayers that I just want to point out here. If you're taking notes, there's what I want to call closet prayers. Just go into the room, shut the door, and focus. And then there are ongoing prayers, the dialogue that you have with God all day long. And both are absolutely essential in the life of a believer. Your prayer life is incomplete if all you do is learn the discipline of going into a room and having a special prayer time. Uh, You may write out prayers or you may uh, pray through the Psalms or whatever your spiritual pattern is, but if you come out of your prayer closet and go throughout your day without ongoing prayer, that's an incomplete prayer life. On the other hand, if you have ongoing prayer with God and that's all you do, you miss the closet prayers. You miss going into the room, shutting the door, focusing, slowing down, and having fellowship with God where you can go deep, where you can... Uh, confess sin and open up your life to the activity of God as you invite him to cleanse you and to repair you or inspire you or correct your life. And so as we think about what Paul is saying here, devote yourselves to prayer, what do you need more? Think about your life. Do you need ongoing prayer? Do you need to like focus on that? Uh, The ongoing dialogue component of your prayer life, do you need that to be improved? Or do you need to go into the room and shut the door, the closet prayer, the unhurried, unrushed, focused dimension of your prayer life improved? Make a decision that you're going to work on whatever area of your prayer life you need to work on. All right, so that's devote yourselves to prayer. Look at verse 3 now. Paul moves to kind of a second half of what he's trying to say in this particular text. Paul is asking the Colossians to pray for him and his inner circle of followers who are trying to spread the message of Jesus Christ. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Now, remember this setting. He's, he, he, tells, he tells the Colossians that he's in prison. So let me ask you a question. If you were in prison and you were writing this to the Colossians, what would you ask for? That for them to pray that you would get out of prison, right? That's not what he prays for. That's not what he asks them for. He says, pray that God would open a door. And he's not talking about the prison door. He's saying, pray that God would cause the gospel to spread. uh, And don't stop praying. And they didn't stop praying. The first century followers would ask and ask and ask, and God did it. And this world was turned upside down. And so here's the question for us. What if we were to ask God, to open doors? And what if we were just to ask and continue to ask? And what if he did it here like he did it in the New Testament church? It could happen. I believe God is at work in powerful ways. What if we, Blue Oaks Church, just asked God to spread the gospel through this place, through the East Bay, more powerfully than it has ever happened before, and he did it? What if every one of us prayed this prayer, God, let me proclaim the mystery of Christ in a way that I never thought possible? What if every single one of us said, God, let me have at least one person who doesn't know you now come to know you this year? What if we all prayed that prayer, and what if God did it? And what if as we gather here in the new year, hundreds of people have walked through those doors, walked through the doors of faith, and we look at each other and we just say, we just kept asking. For the last several months, we just kept asking and praying, and God did it, and this is the greatest adventure of faith that we've ever experienced in our lives. Who wouldn't want that to happen? 
I mean, who wouldn't want to be a part of a church like that? It could happen. It has happened. And it still happens today. But it starts with prayer. Paul says, pray. And then he says, pray for what? Pray that God may open a door. Paul is not new to evangelism. Uh, He's been trying to spread the message of the risen Christ to a lot of different uh, places, and he's been persecuted for it. And he's sitting in a prison cell because of it. And now he's nearing the end of his life, and he's asking the church in Colossae, pray for open doors for this message. Pray for open doors. Paul knows you can't force the message of Christianity through a closed door. You can't force people to receive the message. You can't uh, cram Christ through doors that are locked tight. And so Paul, at this stage in his life, he's at the stage in his life where he says, all I want for you to do is pray that God will open the door of receptivity in people's hearts and minds. Because with God, without God opening a door, we're dead in the water. We can't spread this life-changing message. We can't force it through closed doors. God has to open hearts and minds before we can present this message. Jesus says in John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And Paul is simply acknowledging in this particular text that prayer has to precede any and all evangelistic efforts. They're inexplicably tied together. If you ever hope to lead people to Christ, you've got to be a person who's devoted to prayer. And so let me ask you, do you pray for open doors? Do you ask God to open doors with your friends or your family or your neighbors or your coworkers? I thought of something earlier this morning as I was just working on this and praying. Um, I'm working on the next teaching series after we finish Colossians. We're going to be finished with Colossians next week. And I'm working on the next uh, study, and I'm really excited about it. And so um, I've been working on themes and dates and everything. And so on November 11th, I've decided I'm going to present the gospel in the most clear way that I can present it. Um, and I'm going to talk about our ultimate hope and how our ultimate hope is in Christ and in heaven. And, uh, and I'm going to present the gospel. And so I was thinking as I was working on this this morning, what if we, between October 11th and November 11th, just like committed to pray that God would spread the gospel in the East Bay more powerfully than he ever has before? What if we just commit to doing that? Um, and then I, th- I talked to Garrett, and I was like, can we maybe put something on Facebook? If you go on Facebook, there, we're Blue Oaks Church. You can just look at Blue Oaks Church, and um, we're going to write something on there. And if you will commit to praying for 30 days, just that God would spread the gospel in this area more powerfully than, than he ever has before, would you just go on there and like that or share it or uh, do something like that? And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we had maybe like 1,111 people praying for, for 30 days until 11-11, and um, just see what God does. And do you, know why, do you know why we should do this? you know why we should pray for open doors? Let me just give you an answer in one sentence. Because prayer changes what is possible. Prayer changes what is possible. Paul really believed this. That's why he asked the church to be devoted to prayer. He really believed that doors would be opened through prayer that would remain locked otherwise. He really believed this. He really believed that because of prayer, a timid declarer of the gospel would be made bold. He really believed that. He really believed that because of prayer, a vague presentation of Christ would be made clear. And so he says, pray for this. Walter Wink, a New Testament theologian, says, human history belongs to the intercessors, to those who believe and pray the future into being. History doesn't belong to those we think it belongs to. It doesn't belong to the humanly powerful or the wealthy or the rulers or the armies or the corporations or the global media empires. History belongs to those who intercede before God. History belongs to the intercessors, to those who believe and pray the future into being, to those who devote themselves to praying, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's who the history belongs to. You'll never hear Patty Hanway, our uh, prayer leader, she leads our prayer team, 
or one of our prayer team members say, the least I can do for you is pray. You'll never hear that because they know it's the most they can do for you. There was a lady who, um, she came up last week and she said that her foot uh, was bothering her for several months and she couldn't go for hikes and she loves hiking and it breathes life into her. And uh, so she just asked that God would heal her foot. And so we prayed for her foot. And I know that Patty continued to pray for her foot over the course of the week. And she wrote me an email and she said, Matt, you'll never believe this. My foot is healed. I've, I went on a hike this week and I've not gone on a hike for several months. And I have no pain in my foot. And um, our prayer team knows that prayer is the most that they can do for people. And when we get to the end of the service, I'm going to give you an opportunity to spend some time in prayer doing the most that you can do for the people who are outside of this community. Now, we're not there yet, so don't get excited. Um, you know, we're called to pray, uh, but some of us have a special gift of prayer. I don't know if you knew this, but intercessory prayer is one of the spiritual gifts talked about in the New Testament. Uh, some of you have a special gift for intercessory prayer. And you find it by things like this. Some of you find that you have a special delight in praying for other people. Some of you have uh, an ability to continue praying with great diligence until an answer gets uh, manifested. I believe one such prayer or person is listed in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Uh, Colossians 4, 12, uh, Paul is acknowledging people in their, uh, in their ministries and their lives and we're going to look at this next week as we wrap up the study, but he talks about this radical intercessor, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. This is someone, I think most likely, with this spiritual gift of intercessory prayer, always wrestling and struggling for you in prayer. Some of you often feel an intense burden to pray. You find yourself praying for people maybe that you haven't even seen for years. You look for opportunities to pray for this church. When we talk about needs around here, you find yourself praying for those needs. You know, we talk about other gifts like leadership and teaching and so on. There's a spiritual gift of intercessory prayer, and some of you have it. And so I want to encourage you, if, if you're feeling kind of a tug here, maybe you're thinking, yeah, you know what, I do have that. I do have kind of a delight in praying, and I feel a burden for people and an ability to keep going until an answer gets uh, manifested. Don't hold back. Study what the Bible uh, teaches about prayer. Talk to other people about prayer. Pray about it. <laughs> and I want to encourage you to join one of our teams of people who pray at Blue Oaks. If, and if you didn't know, we have teams that pray uh, for Blue Oaks, and you can get connected with one of them. Uh, if that's you, and maybe you're feeling God tugging at your heart, I just encourage you to write that on uh, your connection card and put it in the offering, and uh, um, we'd love to get you connected. Because if you have this gift, this gift is extremely valuable. All right, now look back at Colossians 4. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Pray that I may proclaim the mystery of Christ. Let me just say something about what it means to proclaim, and then we'll talk about the mystery of Christ. Uh, proclaim is a word in the Bible that can be translated preach. Uh, it can also be translated teach. It can be translated speak. And it can be translated live. And I think it's a combination of all of these. Uh, it's not translated, uh, hold up a sign and scare people. Uh, when we teach, we need to teach it clearly. When we preach, we need to preach it clearly. When we speak about Christ, uh, we, need to make it, we need to make it easy for someone to understand that God loves them. The way we live, there should be an understanding that we're living the gospel of Christ. You know, I believe very strongly that in our society, it begins with living. People are looking at our lives first. In our society, we need to be the message of Jesus Christ before we preach the message of Jesus Christ. Christianity needs, Christianity needs to be caught before it's taught. 
uh, because people don't care what we know until they know that we care. Your life is the message. Has anyone ever told you that? Your life is the message of Jesus Christ. People can see that you've been with Jesus. People know something's different about you. Your life is the message. Does that mean I need to tattoo a cross on my body so that people can see that I'm a Christian? No, that's not what I'm talking about. Some of you have tattoos, and I'm not saying don't get tattoos, but I am saying uh, your body isn't the message. Your life is the message. The same is true with all the Christian stuff, you know, like T-shirts and mugs and bracelets and mints and nutrition bars. Uh, you don't need to have all this Christian stuff so that people know you're a Christian. By the way, the nutrition bar is like one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. I mean, it's made with ingredients found in the book of Deuteronomy. Like, seriously. <clears throat> all the Christian stuff is not going to prove to the world that you are followers of Christ. Jesus said, your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. And I'm sure you've heard this before, actions speak louder than words. St. Francis of Assisi, he, who lived in the 12th century, he said, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. It's how we live our lives. We're to live the mystery of Christ in such a way that it's clear to the watching world that the gospel is actually good news. This is what Paul meant by referring to the mystery of Christ, that the good news is for everyone. In Paul's context, it was that Jesus gave his life for the Gentiles just as much as he gave his life for the Jews. And in our context, it's that Jesus is for the people outside this church just as much as he is for the people inside this church. Jesus is for the people outside this church just as much as he is for the people inside this church. Jesus came for the sick, not for the well. He came for the lost, not for the found. I don't know if you knew this, but in the United States, we have 10 to 12 churches every day close their doors. I mean, just think about this. Between four and 5,000 churches close their doors every year in the United States. I think it has something to do with the fact that we're not proclaiming the mystery of Christ, that Jesus is for the people outside of this place just as much as he is for the people inside this place. There's an atheist by the name of Michael Martin who evangelizes people into atheism by simply pointing the finger at Christians and saying, who wants to be like them? He says, most Christians are unforgiving, violent, mean-spirited, hypocritical, and inconsistent, and they approve of slavery, forsake reason, disbelieve science, and have no opinion on the central issues of today. How did we get to the place where Christians are providing some of the best arguments against Christ? Paul says in Colossians 4, 5, be wise. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. I love this about Paul. He's at this stage in his life where he's seen evangelism done in such a poor, counterproductive way that it's like he's pleading with people. Look, we need to pray for an open door. God has to open the door. And we've got to make the message clear when God opens the door. And we have to stop doing damage to the cause. Stop acting unwise toward outsiders. Stop any obnoxious, overzealous, super, you know, superiority kinds of dynamics that push people away from the God that we're trying to point them to. Now, he doesn't give them a list of all the things that they're never to do. He just pleads common sense. He just says, listen, would you just be wise? Would you just be emotionally and relationally intelligent? Would you be sensitive? Would you pray? And would you listen before you preach? Would you exercise great care when you tell your story and when you tell God's story and when you give witness of one kind or another? Would you just make the most of every opportunity? Now, the word opportunity is an interesting word in Greek. It's a word that can be translated time. Uh, some translations say, Walk in wisdom toward those who are on the outside, redeeming the time. The Greeks used two words for time. One of them was the word chronos. It's where we get chronology from. It's just kind of a clock time, just another tick on the clock. But then a second word they used is the word kairos. It's the word that they would use for a, de de a decisive moment, for a crisis, for a crossroads, what we would call a defining moment. Kairos really in the Greek is the Greek word for 
defining moment. Kronos is clock time, kairos, defining moment. And that's the word that Paul uses here. And what he's saying is there's going to be defining moments in the lives of people around you, moments when for whatever reason, maybe after years of hardness, their heart suddenly open up to God. I got an email from someone recently who said, your sermons these past few weeks have been inspirational and have touched me. I've not believed that God talks to us in this modern day. But recently, I finally realized God has not only been talking to me, he's been screaming in a good way. Your teaching was perhaps the culmination of a year of God trying to reconnect with me. That's kairos. God just keeps tugging at this person's heart, and one day that heart softens and God speaks, and that's a defining moment. That's kairos. Paul wants us to make the most of every opportunity when hearts are open and when hearts are tender like that. And Paul goes on to be a little more specific in verse 6. He says, Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Let your conversation always be full of grace. If you have an opportunity to be a witness, your words need to be full of grace. This is a beautiful expression. He says, I'm asking your conversations with outsiders to be loving and to be winsome and to be filled with grace. I'm asking for you to be attractive presenters of a message of an attractive Savior. Be gracious. Err on the side of grace. This is, by the way, foundational to who we are as a church. One of our core values is a culture of grace. And what we mean by that is we welcome and we love all people, no matter where they are on their spiritual journey, and we give them room to grow. Our vision is that at Blue Oaks, no one would sit alone. That we would appreciate people from all walks of life, that we would love and accept everyone who walks through the doors. We want our conversation to be always full of grace. And then Paul says, seasoned with salt. What does this mean? I just want to take some time to unpack the significance of this phrase, seasoned with salt. It's very interesting and a significant statement that Paul is making. This is what Jesus said one time to his disciples. He said, you are the salt of the earth. And to understand the significance of salt, we have to understand that salt played a much more central role in Jesus' world than it does in ours. Does anyone know what the number one use of salt is in the United States? More than 51% of salt produced in the U.S. is used to de-ice roads. And that was not true for Jesus. (laughs) When he came to the earth, he didn't come to a place where roads were covered with ice and snow because he knew that it was not God's will for people to live in such places. (laughs) He knew that those were the places you visit, you know, to snowboard, and then you come back to places where it's warm. Did you know that only 8% of all salt produced in America is used as table salt? In the ancient world, It was a different story. People discovered that there was something about salt that made it a preservative. It kept decay from setting in. In the ancient world, being around dead bodies was much more common than it is in our day, and decay was considered horrific. There's a verse in Psalms that says, you will not allow your Holy One to see decay. People discovered that there's something about salt that prevents decay, and so it's almost like magic. They found that if you use salt, you could preserve food for times of famine. And so that it literally meant life and death death for them. They discovered that it was a purifying agent because it could destroy bacteria. They discovered that it brings delight to people who are eating because there are special taste buds on your tongue that are designed to respond to salt. So salt became highly valued. So highly valued that the Romans used salt to pay soldiers. Some of you may know that the Latin word for salt is the word salad. It's where we get the word salary from because salt was used to pay soldiers. Uh, It's where we get the expression, he's worth his salt, or she's worth her salt. In the book called Salt, A World History, Mark Kurlansky writes, in the ancient world, salt was uh, one of the most common factors that provoked and financed wars. People went to war over salt. In fact, 
That's why we say when one country is attacked by another, they've been assaulted. No, it's not, I just made that up. <laughs> I was waiting all week to tell you that one. <clears throat> we can't understand what Paul is saying unless we understand that in the ancient world, salt was very important. Paul says, let your speech always be full of grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each other. And Jesus, when he's talking to his followers, says God's plan to protect the world from decay, to purify it, to bring out whatever God flavor it's going to have is you. You are the salt of the, the earth, Jesus says. Let me give you an implication of this. Salt does not exist for its own sake. When was the last time you went to someone's home for a meal and said, this is great salt? Like, where did you get this salt? I think I'm going to change brands. Salt doesn't call attention to itself. No one gets hungry and says, I think I'm going to go home and have a little salt. <laughs> Salt's calling is to lose itself in something more important than itself, and that's when it fulfills its purpose. Let me say that again. Salt's calling is to lose itself into something more important than itself, and that's when it fulfills the purpose for which it was made. And that's what Paul is saying our words should be. Let your speech be seasoned with salt. Let your words have a purpose beyond yourself. You know, we're not just here. We're not just to gather together as a congregation. We're not just here to connect with a few other people so that we have a safe and comfortable place to be. Salt doesn't exist for its own sake. We don't exist for our own sake. It's interesting that Jesus doesn't say, try to be salty or work hard to be saltier. Jesus is simply making an observation. You are the salt of the earth. And those words are so powerful that people often frame them and hang them on the walls of their homes. But this is what Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 5.13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness... How could it be made salty again if it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on by men? Now, why did Jesus have to go and say that? You know, everything was good until he goes to say that. Have you ever seen that hanging on someone's wall? <laughs> Most likely not. And this is the kind of thing that made people uncomfortable when Jesus taught. This is the kind of thing that makes people say to a teacher, give me some kind of secret meaning behind the Greek words so that this doesn't mean what I think it means. You know, here's what our culture will try to do to us. It'll try to seduce us to serve it rather than God, making us useless. No longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Our culture will try to seduce us to spend our lives being too busy, being too driven or too preoccupied with whatever, our career, our money, our status. And I'll tell you what my concern is with this. Our culture will try to seduce us into making the church just kind of a stress management tool. On a bottle of an aspirin, uh, you'll see these words, fast, soothing, temporary relief from pain. Our culture will try to seduce us to bow to it. And then if it can't keep us away from God and his community, it'll try to turn the church into just fast, soothing, temporary relief from pain. But then we go out and we're still enslaved to all the things that everyone else in this culture is enslaved to. And Jesus says, no, that's not the plan. You are the salt of the earth. I know people who go to church year after year and stay on the same crazy treadmill, overworked, overcommitted, overextended financially, still praying about the same stuff that they've been praying about 10 years ago. And the real reason underneath it is, if they're honest about it, is that they've never made the decision that they're going to die to the ways of this culture. So their prayers tend to go along the lines like this. God, relieve me of all the stress and the pressure that I'm under, but let me keep chasing after all the stuff that everyone else is chasing after. And I wonder if there's anyone here today who needs to say, Jesus, I'm going to die to the ways of this culture, and I'm going to live as a difference maker for the kingdom of God. I'll be the salt of the earth. My, season, my speech will be seasoned with salt when I go out into the world. And the good news is when someone in God's community gets salty, it becomes contagious. 
when we become salty and bring out the God flavors in this world, when we make a difference in someone's life, when Jesus makes a difference through us, other people look at us and they're reminded that they want their lives to make a difference too. That's what we all want. You know, we don't come here just to put on services or to run programs, although those can be very important and very helpful. You are the salt of the earth, Jesus says. You are it. You are God's plan to fight the decay of this world. We're it. And Jesus is looking for someone who will say, I will die to the ways of this culture. I will not live in slavery to its values and spend my lifetime and energy according to it and then just use the church as an occasional temporary stress management pain reliever. God, I will live as the salt of the earth. I will allow you to flow through me, and I will make myself useful. One of the interesting, interesting things to me is that the early church was the salt of the earth. They were. And the people who were opposed to it thought they could stop it by persecuting it. They sent the leaders to prison. And guess what happened? The prisons got salty. They said, we'll stop the church by kicking everyone out of Jerusalem. And if you look back at the book of Acts, the believers get kicked out of Jerusalem, and guess what happens? The whole region, first of which is Asia Minor, starts to get salty. The idea was that you could stop the early church by forcing Christians to spread out to disconnect them from their community, but that was just getting the salt out of the shaker. You are the salt of the earth. All we have to do is get out into the world, and it starts to permeate our homes and our workplaces and our neighborhoods and our schools. Can you imagine what Jesus could do with a church full of people who say, all right, God, the number one priority of my life, what I want to do between now and the day I die is proclaim the mystery of Christ. I want to proclaim it clearly. I want to be wise, and I want to make the most of every opportunity. I want to be a part of what you're doing. I want to make a difference for you. Everything I've got, my time, my gifts, whatever they are, my money, whether it's a lot or a little, whatever I've got, it's yours. I'm fully available to be used by you. Can you imagine? Paul says, that's what I want you to do. He says, that's what I want you to pray for. That's what I want you to pray for each other about. Pray for open doors. And make the message clear when the, op- when the door is open. Be attractive and wise toward outsiders. And when you do have the opportunity, let your speech be filled with grace and seasoned with salt. And so we're just going to take a moment right now. And Justin's going to play a next song. And I just want to ask you to pray. Just to intercede for our community of faith, to intercede for the people who are outside of this community of faith, who desperately need to be inside of it. Pray for open doors. I pray that our speech would be seasoned with salt. Pray that we'll be wise in the way that we act toward outsiders. Pray that we'll make the most of every opportunity. We need to pray. So Justin uh, is just going to play the guitar for a little bit, and I just want you to just spend some time praying uh, because history belongs to the intercessors. All right, so just take a few moments and pray.